Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video and today's topic is double sons, petrified people, and biblical worlds. So I got all of these ideas today from emails that viewers have sent me. And I know that it's been a while since I've gone over some of these emails or some of the comments. And I always get so many great ideas, so much great insight that I do wanna make sure that I bring to light the things that I learn from everyone who watches these videos. This beautiful photo is actually from an email that I received recently. And this email is from Andrew and it says, hello, my mother and I watch your channel on a regular basis. Confident fathers completing a work in both of us. We have been studying and reading the Bible along with other texts for roughly six years now. He's shown us the fact of the firmament, giants, titans, some of which seem to have turned to mountains, and we are still learning new things as we go. All of the things my mother's realized over time were lies from the church from childhood have been difficult, but we are happy to let the father untwist what we were lied to about, and he has and still does as I type this out. We agree with you about the old world structures and that something's very wrong with the history we are given. We pray you the best. Here's the pictures I caught the other day of the moon during daylight on May 31st and some sundown shots for kicks I thought you would like. Thank you. And I thank you very much, Andrew, for sending me these photos. First thing that I want to point out is that I think that a lot of times when we think that the church is being lied to, yes, the hierarchy or at least the Christian worldview that what we learn in Sunday school, for example, yes, it is based on lies. But I think that most of the time, our specific local churches do not even realize that they are spreading falsehoods. And unfortunately, not enough of them really dig into the word with an open mind rather than just repeating back what they were taught. So I do want to say that I think that a lot of times it's not deliberate. Although, the, you know, the foundation that it was based on, yeah, that was deliberate and everything has just been passed down to the point where people just believe that what they learned was the truth, as happens, you know, in every area. We were just talking about this with geology and archaeology the other day. And unfortunately, the same thing has been happening in the church as well. Now, I now these are beautiful photos. And actually, I just wanted to share just one of the moon photos just because I think this is really interesting and it's probably just the way that the the film is, but it almost looks like the, the moon is like sitting in something soft, which I know isn't the case, but I just, to me, that's what it looks like. It almost looks like, you know, when you throw a ball and it like goes into something soft, maybe like a piece of foam or a cushion, that's what this looks like to me, just the way that the outline is of this moon. And what is for sure is that I do not see the rest of a sphere here. Um, I, I, I'm fairly certain that the moon phases are actually phasing in and out of its shape too. I believe that the moon changes shapes too and not just the light of it. But that is just my theory and that's not even what my video is about today. I wanted to also show you, and all of these photos are really beautiful, I have to say. I wanted to share this one though because this one actually reminded me of another email that I got several weeks ago and I'm so far behind on my emails. So, and I have tens of thousands of them and I say this all the time, but it's true. If I have not emailed you back, it's just because I am having a really hard time getting caught up. Sometimes it takes a really long time. But anyway, when I was looking at this, it made me think of another email that I had gotten about some 18th century newspaper articles about double sons. So this email is from Mindy, and I'm not going to share all of the articles with you, but we'll just read through a couple of them. Um, if you take notice, they are all from the 18th century. Three sons seen in the sky in Suffolk, England, in 1727, two visible suns in the Aurora element, this is Scotland in 1728, three suns, Edinburgh, Scotland, um, 1750, two parhelia or mock suns, which is a sun dog, 
and that's in Annapolis, Maryland in 1757. Three sons appearing in the firmament, Leicester and Nottingham Journal in England in 1770. Multiple sons and other phenomena seen in the sky, and that's the Newcastle Weekly Current in England, 1785, and Three Beautiful Sons. It's, it's funny that it's, it's three. It, it happens in threes. Not always, but most of the time it's been threes, which I find very interesting. So anyway, let's just read what some of these say. Letters from Oxford inform us of a glorious phenomenon seen there in the heavens about nine o'clock last Wednesday morning of three suns, two very beautiful rainbows and two circles, a greater and a less finely variegated. At five the same afternoon, the three suns appeared again, but without bows or rings. And the, this is really hard to read. I have no idea. False. That's false. The false suns were much fainter and had nothing near the luster and glory with which they shone in the morning. And so what I'm thinking of when I hear this is actually of a reflection of the sun off of the firmament. So this is of a sun dog here. And to um, the untrained eye, this certainly could give the appearance of three suns which is actually why it's possible that there were so many reports of there being three sons, because this is something that is very common with sun dogs. And yes, I do believe that it is a reflection off of the firmament. There are other photos of sun dogs in which you can actually see the bow effect. And um, if you remember from that article, it did say that there were rainbows also. So this is a good example of the bowing effect. And then it, you can certainly see what looks to be rainbow here or rainbow colors on both sides. And yes, it, it almost gives a, a fishbowl appearance. And yeah, I, I know that they will tell you that it's reflecting off of ice particles in the atmosphere. And I believe that it is a reflection off of the firmament. So this next article is from Bristol. We have an account that on the 29th past was seen upon Felton Common, five miles from this city, two visible suns in the aurora element about seven in the morning, which seemed to be about 30 yards distant. I'm curious why sometimes they use a regular S and other times they don't. Complete tangent, but anyway. About the very same time, though not in the same place, Another person saw an appearance of seven suns, all in a cluster, and about three yards distance, six more. And as they seemed to decline, it grew darkish. And then he thought he saw a mourning coach and a hearse glide along. Well, that would be very interesting and quite creepy. So now this one obviously doesn't look like seven suns, but it is another example of a sun dog and just the effects that it can have on the sky, which might be able to explain that report. I'm not going to say that it definitely does, but sun dogs really do have some beautiful variations in appearance. And right here is just another example that almost looks like an eye, doesn't it? Like the the football shape of the eye and then the pupil in there. That's what it looks like. But anyway, yeah, just another really good example of the variations. And we'll just read one more. An extraordinary phenomenon appeared in the skies yesterday morning between 7 or 8 o'clock, seen by many credible persons. It was three suns, the real and natural sun in the center, which was the brightest, the others one on each side of the center. Definitely sounds like a sun dog opposite to each other and imagined by outward appearances to be each of them equidistant from the center. Yes, 100% a sun dog. I have no doubt in my mind about this. They shone bright, but not so bright as the real sun and of a deeper red, as were the clouds surrounding the two new suns. When they began first to appear and how long they continued, we cannot tell, as not been soon enough observed. But they sent forth frequent seeming sparks of fire and at last vanished on a sudden. So a lot of the explanations 
obviously of these sun dogs, or sorry, of these multiple sons could definitely be sun dogs. But what about those cases where it's not a sun dog? Now, I'm one of these for sure, someone might look at this and think that there might be another son behind that one. Most people nowadays would understand that that is just due to maybe atmospheric lensing or some sort of refraction in the air. But to the untrained eye, it may appear that something like this would also be the cause of, you know, a, a second sun in the sky. I did find this article, which I found to be very interesting. Two suns spotted in China defy explanation. And this was from 2011. And it says, weeks after a story shot across the web claiming that the imminent explosion of a nearby star, which you most of you know that I don't believe in the space narrative, but I'm just going to read the article, would result in the appearance of a second sun in the sky, a story that was later debunked. Oh, the fact checkers were out even then. Two suns were caught on camera yesterday in China. The suns, one fuzzy and orange, the other a crisp yellow orb, appeared side by side, one slightly higher than the other. What's going on? Life's Little Mysteries, a sister site to space.com. Um, let's see. Ask Jim Kaler who squelched the excitement over the aforementioned exploding Beetlejuice and who has written books on the day and night sky. And the double sun image is an effect of optical refraction, Kaler said, but it's a pretty darn rare one and one not fully explained by science. And I'm not going to pretend to know if that, you know, what, what this is, but you know, it is certainly not a sun dog and it's certainly not what we were looking at in that beautiful photo um, that was sent to me. And it could it could very well be the refraction that that this um, astronomer is referring to, but nonetheless, it's it's equally interesting as is this. Now, this kind of I don't know this could just be a reflection, but that one also kind of gives a sun dogging look. But what this apparently is, it looks like two suns in the sky, and this is a, according to this, one of them is the moon. So it says, today two suns appeared on the U.S.-Canada border. One is the true sun and another is the moon. This phenomenon is known as moon hunter and happens when the earth is changing axis, which I, yeah. Anyway, the moon reflects the light of the sun with such intensity that it reminds us of a second sun. And again, I don't believe that the moon is reflecting the light of the sun. I believe the moon emits its own light. But I also think that it's very possible that there are times that they are both in the sky at the same time. And due to some sort of atmospheric elements, they can both appear to be equally bright, which could be the case in this. I know that there are those who believe that there is a planet Nibiru that's kind of like hiding behind the sun. I don't ascribe to that simply because I don't believe in planets as they are presented to us. But I'm not going to pretend to know if, you know, there's another explanation to these other than what we're given. I just think that they're super interesting to look at and to think about. So moving on to another email, it says, hi, Shelly, I have been watching your videos for quite a while now. I am not a big commenter, nor do I ever reach out to creators via Instagram or email. However, recently I read a comment on the video mentioned above. It stated that the old Bibles mentioned that God had created worlds, plural, and that the S had been dropped on the newer versions of the Bible for whatever reason. Well, we know the reason, right? Knowledge is power. Immediately after I read that comment, I went on eBay to look for a Bible written in the early 1800s because I figured that may have been before a lot of the resets. Unfortunately, the Bibles listed were really expensive. So the next day I went to a local thrift store and lo and behold, there it was. A Bible published in 1804 in London. Needless to say, that subscriber was right. I have attached the picture of the comment along with pictures of the mentioned scriptures straight out of the Bible. So thank you very much for sending this, Ashley. And here is the comment that she attached. Um, it kind of starts mid-sentence, but I'm just going to read what it says. 
passages in more modern Bibles, they have removed the S at the end of the word worlds, which is what makes it plural. I remember sitting in church years ago as my pastor read one of the passages from Hebrews that mentions the worlds. Hebrews 1, 2 says, Hath in the last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Not world, worlds. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 says, But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, even the wisdom that have been hidden, which God foreordained before the worlds unto our glory. Hebrews 11, 3 says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed and created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which, with our, which are visible. If you look online now, you will not find a single passage in any Bible version that uses the word worlds, not even the Berean translation. You can still find the old passages in old Bibles or searching Bible passages that mention worlds, and a website that documented them should be one of the first options. So actually, I'm just curious. I'm going to go on one of the Bible apps and just type in one and see if I can find one online that says worlds. So Hebrews 1, 2. So we'll look that one up. Whoops. Trying to move too fast. All right. I usually try to do Bible Hub. Okay. Now this one says universe. So they put that in there. New Living Translation says universe. English Standard Version says world, singular. Berean says universe. Um, Berean Literal Bible says the ages. King James says worlds. New King James says worlds. So that is there. But yeah, as we can see, the Legacy Standard Bible also says worlds. But most of them, oh, here's another one. The American Standard Version says worlds. So it's not as common. And the ones that we will typically hear will not have a plural version of, of world. That is certainly for sure. And we have to think to ourselves, you know, what exactly does it mean by worlds? Well, it could mean worlds as in this world here, maybe heaven as a world, maybe the domain of the, the angelic, even though they're thought to reside in the heavens also, maybe a world, or they could also be, let me see, where do I have it? I, I love the idea of puddles. And yeah, I don't have any evidence of this, but I certainly believe that it's feasible, especially, you know, and I know that Admiral Byrd was a 33rd degree Freemason. And I know that that generally deems him as untrustworthy, but we also do know that they do mix in some truth with their lies. And he does talk about land beyond the pole. So that, you know, gives the thought that it's possible that there are other worlds out there, because if you think about it, the word earth just means land. That's really all that it means. The Bible itself does not tell us how much land there is. You know, we just believe that this is, is earth because this is all that we know. Um, but what else is out there? And yeah, we could certainly look at these as other worlds too, especially if this could be where the, um, where some angelic beings or some, what we might call extra terrestrials are. And remember, extraterrestrial just means extra land. It doesn't mean like some space person. And so, yeah, here's just a photo of the Bible that she found. And it does say, Hebrews 1, 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So, yeah, the question it really is, what exactly is meant by worlds because we know that when the bible is talking about principalities and thrones um and dominions it is, it is not referring just to beings it is referring to places and yes i would deem those as other worlds so this last one 
is really, really interesting, super interesting, because it brought to mind just the idea. I, everyone always tells me to watch Roger Spur on Mud Fossil University, and I have been a subscriber of his for years. So yes, I, I am subscribed to his channel, and I do watch some of his videos. I don't watch as much YouTube as I used to just because I don't have time. But I, I do know that a lot of what he finds is petrified biology. And yes, there are petrified people as well. Now, in this case, this um, email just shares how it is purposely done. So let's just read through that. But I'm going to say that not all of it happens purposely, as in in a lab by other human beings. But let's just read this to start with. Corpses made into marble. Dead bodies transformed into solid stone by means of antiseptic gas. Thomas Holmes of Brooklyn, an expert on the subject of embalming fluids, claims to have perfected a process by which the human body can be petrified. He calls it the antiseptic gas process of embalming and says that within a week he will make tests at Bellevue Hospital, New York. I just want to point out quickly, this is from 1895. Just, just saying. Dr. Holmes has in his office a petrified arm, which looks like a piece of marble. Yikes, I would not want that as a paperweight. Dr. Holmes claims that the antiseptic gas can now be manufactured as cheaply as any fluid in use for embalming. After the gas has been injected, the doctor says the body will gradually solidify and turn white as marble, even the nails and hair, but the latter only close to the skull. Dr. Holmes is now 78 years old. He said, I believe I have discovered a process of embalming superior to the old Egyptian. The arm which I embalmed by the process is as hard as stone and will remain so forever. Now I am about to organize a company for the manufacture of glass caskets lighted by electricity by which the living can view the faces of their dead friends. God intended man to return to dust but there are a good many who would find comfort in looking on the faces of their dead. And here is an illustration of the marbleized forearm that he has in his office. Um, I just want to read. It is the color of pure white marble. The fingers are twisted and the fleshy part of the arm is furrowed with deep wrinkles. It sounds really gross. Although deformed in appearance, there is nothing about it to suggest that it was ever a piece of real flesh, responsive to the volition of a human being. The observer would more naturally imagine that the arm was a plaster cast taken from the body of some person deformed in that member. So it just goes on to talk about the embalming, well, not the embalming process, but the process of how he did this. Um, and it this actually reminds me, we go like from one thing to another, uh, something that my friend Donita from Prairie Dust told me about once, a fossilized leg found petrified still in his cowboy boot. And that is it. And I don't know if this, this certainly looks like a sock to me, doesn't it? I mean, you see the, it would look like the little, I don't know what, what they call them not seams, but just the design in the sock. I don't know, but I'm assuming that's what that is. And this would be the marbleized, petrified leg. A human leg and foot bones found fossilized to solid stone inside a rubber-soled cowboy boot. The discovery was made in a dry creek bed near a West Texas town. How could this cowboy be thousands or even millions of years old inside a century-old boot? Another mystery created by an ancient earth and ancient fossil mythology. And leave that, is that the inside of it? This amazing discovery by Jerry Stone in 1980 appears to be a great mystery because the modern naturalistic worldview of an earth billions of years old describes such fossils as being many thousands or even millions of years old. Therefore, when a cowboy boot of perhaps a mere hundred years was found with a fossilized leg yet inside of it, an apparent paradox emerged. How could this be? The seeming paradox is resolved simply by unlearning the modern worldview of an ancient earth. Whether any fossil is ancient is neither observable nor testable directly in the present. Ancient fossils are based solely 
on evolutionary assumptions. In light of these wild assumptions regarding fossils, what we actually find scientifically and experimentally is that the fossilization process can and perhaps only occurs rapidly. Science has shown that under unique chemical and environmental circumstances that involve water and sediments created by floodwaters, fossils are formed. That explanation actually reminds me of a book that I'm reading now called The Summoning, Preparing for the Coming Days of Noah, and it's by Carl Gallups. And I actually highlighted a section in chapter 25 that actually really explains this very well. In the production of a genuine fossil, a geological disturbance happens suddenly. I'm thinking flood. Obviously not Noah's flood for the cowboy boot. I'm just saying it could have happened with the flood too. It occurs with such rapid elemental power that entire communities of creatures and vegetation are trapped and buried, often alive, under unimaginable pressure and heat. Volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and rapid catastrophic flooding can bring about such fossiliz fossilization. Normal burial processes simply do not produce fossils. And so really that, that answered a question that, that I had um, about so many of the fossils that we find that they, they were clearly almost frozen in time. You know, we have animals giving birth. We have a fish, you know, in the process of eating another fish. They didn't even have time to stop doing what they were doing. It was instant just like the snap of a finger. And this actually brings to mind a channel that I was just introduced to a couple of months ago. And I don't even know if they're currently making videos anymore. It's called, the, the channel is called I Am Created. Um, I think that the last videos that I saw created by them were like three years ago, so probably not. But they have a playlist called Flood Bodies. It's a series documenting and examining the petrified bodies of the antediluvian or pre-flood world. And over here are some of the videos on the playlist. And I'm going to say that I found it deeply disturbing to watch it, but also very, very intriguing. And the idea is that many of the statues that are found in cemeteries or around the world are not actually statues but are the petrified bodies of the people who died in the flood. So this is not to say that every statue out there is a petrified, marbleized human being. Clearly that would be ridiculous. But the premise of this channel is that there are many statues out there that bear much evidence that they were once living beings. Um, sometimes there is bone that like, um, that is kind of sticking out of something that may have been damaged in some way in the fossil fossilization process. Other times, I'm just going to go back here. I'm just going to go through. These are the, the channel, um, that I just showed you. This is his Pinterest page or her Pinterest page. I don't know. But anyway, there are evidences of faces, for example, where you can kind of see it melting off, so to speak. Like it just looks like, or sometimes like even like an eyeball looks like it has been taken out of its socket and is kind of resting on the cheekbone. So I don't know if it's going to let me keep looking without signing in because I forgot my password long ago because I don't go on Pinterest anymore. But, and so the idea of this channel is that all of the people who were left in the flood were actually the children of Cain. Um, and they believe that there is evidence that they had reptilian features. Um, which I, I'm going to admit that I don't see a lot of what they're describing. I definitely think that it has merit that there are some petrified bodies from the flood, but very often a lot of the things that they're seeing, I don't quite see like the scales that they're um, 
trying to describe and everything, but it just might be just because I don't have good enough vision. I don't know, but it is certainly worth taking a look. So yeah, so I don't ascribe to all of the ideas of this channel, but some of the, some of the specimens that are shared in that, in those videos, yes, they're very convincing and you can definitely see how it is possible that they are, that they were living beings. Now this one here, I believe that Roger Spur actually talked about this one and I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong. I know someone will <laughs> that I believe that there were specimens taken from this that were analyzed and that it was found to have biological, um, material in it. So is, is this the, what, what is this called? I don't even remember. I know it's a Titan, but anyway, so, and this could be another example. Now, another thing about the flood bodies channel is that they believe that the waters that came down from above during the flood actually kind of froze the people the instant that it hit them. So when I think of the flood and people being fossilized from the flood, I'm just thinking of just this sudden huge deluge, maybe all of the sediment just instantly encapsulating them where they are and fossilizing them there, um, where the person, the creator of this channel seems to believe and this, this would be heartbreaking if this, because we have to remember pre-flood, yes, there, there were Elohim down on the earth at that time. So you just, you just don't know. But yeah, the creator of this channel does, does believe that it was just, they were frozen the instant that the waters hit them and that that's how they came to be. But, and, and I do have to say that a lot of the quote, statues or people that they show, they, they do like, look like they were, some of them look scared. Um, some of them look like they were reaching out to help someone. So, you know, we're, we're living in a time where so much is being learned that I'm at the point now where nothing would surprise me. But anyway, that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.